I worked my entire life to buy a house, so imagine my distraught when I come home from a long day of work and see my house burnt to the ground. I don't think this was an accident, and I'm going to get to the bottom of it. It's the closest ones to you that hurt you the most. Those were the one of the first words Aunch told me when we met for the first time in school as he saved me from my closest friends. And that's when we started what we had until he did the same thing my friends did, but just ten times worse. I thought he was my soulmate. We were so perfect together, and even though we did not have money, we were still happy to be with each other. He was my strength, and I thought I was his. But boy, was I mistaken. I never expected him to change sides in the blink of an eye. This is how my boyfriend and my parents turned into my worst enemies. It all began a year ago when I graduated from college. I was finally starting to build my life from scratch. My family, who was just mom and dad, lived in the lower middle class neighborhood while Aunt lived in the low class neighborhood. We were both young, about 15 years old when we met. We fell in love at first sight and he asked me to be his girlfriend a few months after we met. We needed nothing apart from each other. Although, my parents did not approve of our relationship because of his family's financial status. We were still inseparable, and he was nothing but a sweet, loving, and humble person. But my mom, both mom and dad, thought I deserved more. And they could be really controlling at some points, and so they forbid me from seeing him. I would always sneak out at night to go and see him because, well, the love we had just did not consider our parents' financial status, or we had our own dreams and goals. Since we attended the same school, we helped each other study and performed exceptionally well. It was then time to go to college. I can say I was fortunate to have gotten a scholarship. Nonetheless, Anch, unfortunately, did not get a scholarship or a student loan to pursue his dreams. Since he was good at drawing, he decided to start drawing in town to generate income to feed his family. We thought our relationship would end because of the distance, but instead, we grew stronger. Anyways, my parents were not happy with the fact that I had to go away for college. They even tried to sabotage my application so I did not get accepted. But I was always a step ahead of them. I packed and got ready for college. I always held my head high and I imagined my future every night before I went to bed to remind myself of the big dreams waiting for me on the other side of college. We always spoke on the phone with Anch every night to update each other about our daily life. Apart from that, Anch made sure to pay me a visit every chance he got. More so, we would write letters to each other and send gifts on anniversaries birthdays, Christmas, and New Year. My parents slowly stopped giving me money and blamed it on the distance. They would always try to persuade me to go back home by trying to make me feel bad about leaving home in the first place. I always replied to them, Mom, Dad, I have dreams, okay? I will not back down for anything until I know that my goals are accomplished. Even though they were not happy, I did not let it get to me. I searched for a part-time job to support myself since my parents had stopped landing me a financial hand. Graduation finally came and my parents traveled to see me shine in my graduation robe, even though they hated the fact that I've gone so far from home. Well, I went back home after graduation and my mom had already started discussing with her friends in town to give me a job because she could not handle me going away again. Anch was not only happy to see me, he was also very proud of me for reaching the short distance destination I'd left home for. And to add to that, although I had friends who would go out partying all night long, I did not let the temptation get the best of me. I started looking for a job out of town behind my parents' back. I knew they would not allow me to move out of the house it was good news for me to hear that I was called in for an interview out of town. I had to break it to my parents that I got a job out of town and I got a lecture of my life that I would not forget. 
They tried to persuade me to stay home, but I could not afford to throw away this opportunity I've just gotten. The night did not end with us in good terms, so I went to sleep at Anche's place. The next morning, I then went home to prepare for my trip. As I approached the front porch, I could see a luggage, but I could not really identify who they belonged to. As I got closer, I could now clearly see that they were mine. On top of the bags was a letter. It said, It is your life. Do what you want. If leaving your parents and showing how unappreciative you are is, then go ahead. Don't step foot in this house unless you're willing to stay. I was annihilated by my parents' actions, so I took my bags and I went to say goodbye to Anch before I left for my interview. He gave me a little cash that he's been saving in his piggy bank. I could not be any more thankful to him. I was determined to pursue my dreams and no one and nothing was going to stop me. Not even my parents kicking me out of the house. I went for my interview and it was a bit harder than I expected, but I did not put my head down. Since I had nowhere to stay and the money Anch had given me was not enough to rent a room, it was only enough for food. I saved it for food and I slept at the service station for three days. My beautiful hair got dirty and my body sent rigid. I finally received a call that said I had gotten the job and I could start right away. I couldn't be happier. I used the last few cents I had to pay for a bath and I left for work. My colleague felt for me and asked if I was okay. She gave me a shoulder to cry on, and after I told her my problem, she took me in and gave me a roof above my head. Everything was going smoothly, and after I finally got my first salary, I thanked her for everything and got a beautiful place on my own, and even found Anch a contract with Visual Art Company, and he came to live with me. I felt good living a soft life. And even though my parents were not part of my happiness, I was still happy. A month passed by, and we were doing great with Anch. Furthermore, I was not only doing great things at work, but I was also learning a lot. I was growing, too. As I got home from work, I was caught off guard by the smoke coming from my new house. Just when things started falling into place, after my parents chased me out of the house, then my house burned down. Although, it was not completely burned to ashes, I still could not live in it because half of the house was damaged, and I lost all my belongings, including my property documents and some of my college awards. I now had to start from scratch again. I was devastated to see how damaged my house was. I sat outside waiting for Anch to come back home, as I've been calling him and he was just not picking up. Anch never came that day. Instead, he sent me a text to let me know that he's gone back home to visit his parents because his mother was ill. I could not believe I had to endure this all alone. All my hard work flushed down the toilet just like that. There I was, sobbing to myself like a hopeless orphan. How can tables turn so fast? Somehow, my gut kept telling me that my house burning down was not an accident at all. But I kept ignoring it because, well, I grew up never blaming other people. After the fire brigade put out the fire, I tried to go inside to see what survived. But the police did not allow me in as I would interrupt investigations and might as well misplace and move evidence if I would turn out to be an arson crime. I kept calling Anch to hear from him, but I still can't get a hold of him. I started thinking that maybe he heard about the incident and he had started blaming me for it. But I needed to hear it from him to ensure that he really heard about it or that he was really blaming me about it. I gave my statements to the lead officer in the investigation, and I went to try to find a place to stay as the investigation was ongoing. As the evening came, I took a bath and tried Anch just more to see if I would get any luck, but still no luck. I cried myself to sleep and kept asking the heavens, why me out of all the people in the world? The next day, 
I woke up to go to work and when I arrived, my boss approached me and said, You look miserable. Take a week off. I looked at him and I assumed he did not hear about the tragic accident of my house burning down. I'm sorry, sir. It's just a little personal problem, but I can assure you that I'll be productive and I will not lose focus, is what I said to him. He replied to me with sympathy. I know what happened. I've seen it on the news and I know how disturbed you are right now, but you don't need to worry about work. By the way, you're the most hardworking employee I've ever had in this firm, and at a day's work for you is equal to a whole week's task. I really don't mind. He put his hand on my shoulder and pointed at the door. I did not think I needed time off until my boss released me from work. I now had time to help out in the case. I went to the scene, and that's when the officer approached me and told me that a jerry can of gasoline and a fire lighter in a trash can just a few blocks away from my place. They suspected it was arson. I knew my gut could not play games like that. I wondered who wanted to put all my hard work in vain. I was new in town, and I had no enemies or people who envied me. I was distressed to have found out that someone set fire to my house. I went back to the hotel and cried like I've just lost a parent. I just could not get to myself to believe that someone would want to hurt me. Because, well, I treat people with respect, as I believe that people will treat you the same the way you treat them. A few days passed by, and I was in my room, then I hear a knock on the door. I went to answer, and there stood a police officer. He asked me to come with him, and we went to sit. He told me that someone went to the station to turn himself in for burning my house down, and they asked me to see before going to prison. I kept asking myself who could it have been, but I could not think of who it could be. I hurried to grab my bag, and we left to the station to go meet this so-called suspect. And when we reached the interrogation room, I could not believe my eyes. Sitting there was Anch, bowing in his shame. I ran to him and hugged him, and I was glad to see him. I was also surprised why he was turning himself in for something he's not committed. The officer went out of the room and Anch asked me to sit. My love, I know I'm not worthy to be talking to you right now. I did not want to do it, but they persuaded me. They offered me a lot of money. The money was more than enough to pay for my college tuition, and I had no other chance but to do it. He said to me in my eyes filled with crocodile tears, I could not believe that someone I thought was my soulmate destroyed what I've worked hard for like it was nothing. It took me a while to process and believe that he was the one who burned down my house after I made effort to bring him to a better and much bigger town. I found him a good job where he made money five times more than he made at home and gave him a good place to stay. I asked him, who paid you? Who paid you to set my house on fire? And he said to me, Bell and Simon asked me to burn your house down. They want you to go back home and take care of your father who's sick. I never really went home because of my mother. My mother's perfectly fine, but to be honest, I went back to meet with your parents for the payment. But they set me up and they lied to me. They did not pay me. I cannot express how sorry I am right now. I believe that your parents would be the reason for me finally going to college. I threw a slap in the middle of his face because I was disappointed in him. You idiot, what have I done to you that it did not even take you a thought to treat me like trash? I thought I meant something to you, but it looks like you were just playing me. I felt so stupid right now. Is your apology even genuine, or is it because Belle and Simon played you? After all these years, and you still don't know how persuasive my parents are? So, you get excited because they told you they could get you to college, and you immediately throw me off the cliff? I remembered what he said to me years back, that it is the closest people to you that hurt you the most. He was right. 
The pain I felt was unexplainable. My own birth parents teamed up with my boyfriend to get me back home by force. How could people be so cruel and heartless? Did they even think about how I would feel when they heartlessly burned my house down? I stood up and knocked at the door for the officer to let me out. I requested for the arrest of both Aunt, Mom, and Dad. If they could burn my house down, they could easily pay someone to kill me. I know my parents were obsessed with their little girl, but they've gotten out of hand and they need to be stopped. The fingerprint reports came and proved that the prints on jerry cans were aunches. The police took his statement against mom and dad and they were then arrested by the local police and transferred to the bigger city that I was living in for the court hearing. They were all sentenced 20 years in prison, arson involving someone's place of residence. After some time, I finally went back to work and I promised myself to never visit any one of them in prison because it would only bring me pain to see their face. The insurance company also paid for the renovation of my house and it looked beautiful after the renovations. This world is full of selfish and heartless people, but I guess that's just how the world was created. Alright, so what I want to know from you guys, who was the biggest villain of the story? Was it OP's boyfriend who actually burnt the house down? Or was it her parents who set her up and made the boyfriend commit the horrible duties? Let me know in the comment section down below. And our second and final story today, it's about a friend who did an unbelievable act. It is one of the biggest backstabbing acts that one can do. Let's talk about it. They say your school friends are your friends forever, but that's not always the case. I'm 24 female, have had my best friend Laura ever since we were in high school. I was a newcomer and she welcomed me with open arms, which I appreciate because I struggled a lot with friends as I had also just moved from another state. So we weren't friends ever since we were children, but we were close enough in high school that she was pretty much the only person I hung with. The thing is, though, being very close in high school doesn't guarantee that you'll be very close forever. Even though we were extremely close in high school, college was a different kind of situation. We both went to different universities, so we did not have the opportunity to stay in touch at all. But we still did meet up and hang out when we could. It was four years of just texting and meeting once every few months, and that was it. After college, I went back to my state to find work. I got a 9-to-5 office job. I was glad that I was able to find something at all, but I was worried about fitting in again after spending so many years away. Fate is tricky, though, as on my first day of work, I ran into Laura. It turned out she was also just hired. I could not believe the coincidence, but it somewhat made sense since it was her major but in different schools. From the get-go, we started talking again and catching up. She did not seem all that different, but she was definitely more world-wary. In high school, she was the innocent nerd all the time, but after college, it seemed like she went through some stuff and had more of an edge to her. The first couple of months at work were indeed fantastic. We had completely caught up, and I felt like things are pretty close to how they were back in high school. But you could never recapture that flame. Laura knew more people in town since her university was in state, so she would show me around and we'd go on weekends a lot. Because, well, we were both new, though, we had to figure things out together, and we did not have many workplace friends as we spent most of our time together. Even though the first couple of months were great, things started to take a strange turn. Laura started missing a few days of work and she almost got in trouble. And anytime I asked her why, she told me she was a little bit tired and that she'd get better. She never elaborated exactly what she felt, but she did seem quite tired. Now, I wanted to help her as much as I could, but she always refused me coming to her house to help her. I covered a couple of shifts for her work so she would not get canned entirely, and I did what I could. She kept refusing to tell me what was wrong for the longest time. Until one day, I kept calling and calling and calling, and she wasn't answering. 
something was up. So me and a couple of other people from work went over to her house to check on her. She opened the door and looked awful. I don't know what's happened to her, but she did not look like she normally did. She welcomed everyone inside and we brought her chocolate and flowers and wished that she'd get better. After the two people from work who came with me left, Laura sat me down to deliver a bombshell. She told me that she had lung cancer. I was absolutely shocked and I tried my best not to show it. I told her that I was there for her and everything and we discussed it. She told me it's still early stages so she could live with it normally, but she might get super tired occasionally. I stayed with her the whole evening and helped her with everything she needed. I knew I might have to cover for her at work a lot, but I did not expect it to go the way it did. The first month was alright, she did not seem too tired and she did not even want to tell anyone in the office. She just told them that she had some extreme allergies that she was taking medication for. I had to cover a couple of shifts and that was it. Over time though, things started to get a little bit too much. She would call me and tell me she's extremely sick and I'd have to go over to her house and help her with a lot of stuff like laundry and even cooking. I was pulling double duty covering for her at work in the morning and helping her at home later. I didn't know if it would be like this forever, but I had a moral duty to help her. She called me one night that she felt awful and that she was getting treatment the next day. The next day, I covered for her, but our boss kept pushing me. He told me that it was over for her and that she would get fired. So I told him no and that I would keep covering for her and doing double the work. He kept pressuring me and asking me why I was defending her so much and I told him it was because she had cancer. As soon as I told him, he spread it around the entire office like a wildfire and she became a sort of martyr. On the day she would come, she got the attention and care of everyone who wanted to help her. This included gifts, food, and more. She explained everything to our boss and co-workers and told them that she was getting better and that the treatment was working. But she said this about three times in the span of months. She would get extremely sick, call me and have me help her at work or home and then suddenly get better and spend the week at the office as if she was perfectly healthy. I did not want to doubt her, but the pattern of behavior was quite odd, especially since it was almost time to the first and third week of each month. When she did come to the office, she was feeling better. I could see her trying as much as possible to appeal to the manager of ours. He had a soft spot for cancer patients, as apparently his mom has died of cancer. So, he became very sympathetic with her and helped her around a lot, and even gave her a ride home a couple times. Of course, when she was home, I had to go and help her. I did not understand why she would be so fine at the office in the morning, but very tired and in need of my help suddenly at night. Something was a bit suspicious, this whole thing, and I had this gut feeling that I did not like. I tried to test out a theory, so I called her and told her that I had the flu and that I could not come over that evening to help her out. She didn't say anything, and I was sure she could not call anyone else. The next day at the office, she did come and did not even mention a word. While talking with everyone else, she mentioned something about an event she went to last night. Boom, I had her and something and asked her how she went to the event if she was at home tired the whole night and even needed my help. I could see it in her face. She got a bit nervous, but then told me that she felt better a couple hours later and went. I didn't know what to think of the whole thing, but I did not like how she was using how tired she was to constantly seek out attention from the entire office. Our manager also kept piling on more of her on my shoulders one at a time, day by day, when I complained that it was too much and that I could not handle all this. He gave me his lecture about helping those in need and that she might literally be living her last days. He made me feel guilty for being frustrated and doubting her. 
but I could not take it anymore, and I did not like the fact that, unlike at first, I did not feel any sense of appreciation from her. I tried to call her one time so that I would go to treatment with her to make sure she was fine, but she kept trying to get away from the whole thing and avoid me. When I just kept insisting, she told me that I was pressuring and embarrassing her and that she did not like to take anyone with her because she did not like the feeling of vulnerability and even started to cry on the phone. I had no idea it would be this extreme, so I let it go. I got so suspicious, I did my own research about cancer and treatments. I spent a couple days trying to find out all I can about the subject and her behavior, and the things that she was doing just did not line up with what I read. I called a doctor relative of ours and told him the whole situation. He told me that something was up. He told me that there was no way she was telling the truth, so I knew I had to confront her. She called me one night to go help her with something around the house, and when I showed up, I asked her what she was feeling. I told her that I've done my own research about the matter to try to help her, but she seemed upset by this and asked me why. I needed to find out for sure, so I told her that I knew she was faking. She looked shocked and stressed at first, but she quickly pivoted and looked angry. She started yelling and telling me that I was a fake friend and a horrible person for accusing her of something like this. She kept going on and on in this panicking stage that made her seem even more suspicious. She told me that I was just jealous. She was getting all the attention in the office, especially from Mike, one of our managers whom she clearly liked. I told her that she was being ridiculous and that I could not care less about the attention she was getting, but that her actions and behavior just do not line up at all with a cancer patient. And I don't know. She faked tears as if she was crying and asked me to leave and not come back. A part of me felt guilty and sympathetic, but I was also sure she was lying, so I took it to the people who would really know. Her parents. She did not have the best relationship with her parents, so I did not know if she would ever tell them. But it was worth a darn shot. I went over there and told them the whole thing, and they told me they didn't even know anything about it, and they would not be surprised if she was faking. When I asked them what happened that drove them apart, they told me that during college, she faked this whole story about being pregnant so she can get money from them and made up a whole thing about abortion and struggling. And they found out it was all lies. It made sense now that she kept making up stories, but I did not know why she would be doing this. The next day when I went to the office, I was met with so much anger and disgust. She told everyone that I thought she was faking her cancer, which made things worse for me. I kept getting so many side eyes and people asking me what's wrong with me. I did not know how to explain it to everyone, but I knew that I had to prove it. I did not even have my normal circle sit with me anymore at lunch. She had completely taken over the entire office with pity. She was also noticeably trying to get closer to Mike, and it hit me that the entire thing might have been a plot to get more attention from him. In the bathroom, I confronted her, and I told her that I knew she was faking, and that when I prove it, all hell will break loose. She did look nervous, which felt good, and supported my hypothesis. For an entire month, my life was even harder. I could not get through the day at work without feeling the toxicity, so I came up with a plan. One night after work, I went over to her house, and my phone was live streaming in my purse. She had missed the day of work because she was, quote, feeling ill. So I first needed to prove that she was fine. I wanted to make sure everyone on Facebook knew her lies, and I knew how to get it out of her. As soon as she opened the door, I was met with hostility. She spoke as if she was very healthy and even raised her tone. I told her that it's odd that she's acting like this when she was supposed to be sick at home. Quote, you're only here to make my day worse, aren't you, she says. 
I started telling her people at work were suspecting that I was right and that she was really fine. Well, that one did it. She started being nervous at first, but then told me I was a liar. I confronted her with the college pregnancy story, and she asked me how I found out. I kept pressuring her and telling her that if she kept hiding the lie, the office would humiliate her. And I told her that Mike was on his way over here now. She started to panic a little bit, but under pressure, she started yelling and told me that she really is faking, but that no one would believe me. She told me that <laughs> if I kept yelling it for a hundred years, nobody would believe me and that I'd still end up alone and miserable while she got all the attention. I pulled out my phone and showed her the live stream and the look on her face was priceless. She started panicking and I showed her how many people were listening. She immediately kicked me out and I could not be happier. The next day, she did not bother showing up for work because she knew the kind of backlash she would get. She got fired immediately via email for missing days and lying about the reason. Everyone at the office apologized to me for the way they treated me for not believing. Especially Mike. Mike told me that she was acting strange around him and that she kept using her cancer as an excuse to ask him for favors, and that made him uncomfortable. I asked him if they had any history, and he told me that they knew each other in college, and he rejected her a couple times, and that working together was completely awkward because of all the mess. I told him that she might have faked the whole thing because of him and to try to get his attention and told him about the pregnancy thing with her parents. The whole thing was a bomb going off at the company. The managers were furious at her for being played, and they decided to sue. They came to me to testify, and at first, I was a little bit hesitant. So I told them to give me time to think. I wanted to take this time to try to call Laura and see if she had a change of heart and saw the error of her ways. But as soon as she picked up the phone, she started insulting me and throwing a tantrum, so I just instantly hang up. Call back the company and told them, yes, I will testify. She did not appreciate the attempt, so I had no mercy. The company went through with the lawsuit, and ironically, as soon as Laura got the notice and found out, she called me and begged me to help her during all of this, and she was genuinely scared. I took this opportunity to ask her why she did this, and she told me it was for Mike, and to get attention in general because, well, during college she faced hard times and became extremely lonely, that she developed this obsession with trying to have people care for her. A part of me sympathized for her, but we still went through with the lawsuit regardless because a person who fakes a pregnancy and cancer can fake a phone call asking for help. Her family found out and did not even try to contact me to stop. After the whole ordeal, my life became way more stable. Work became much better and I was back to taking my normal workload. I even had enough time to volunteer for helping actual cancer patients. And this time with them gave me such purpose and I felt like I was actually doing something important. I cannot believe somebody would fake something so horrible just for the attention. Let me know in the comment section, do you think her time that she was sentenced for was too harsh or not harsh enough? Drop your opinions and tell me why you think that way in the comment section, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. I hope you have an amazing day, and Mr. Redditel will see you in the next one.